was, in retrospect, recognised as a breath of fresh air, but at the time, somewhat of a cultural shock. I hope we've moved on since then. Paul began his work in Staffordshire um, with a, a 1973 a publication on the Moorcroft pottery. He went on to work on a Minton exhibition for the Minton factory held at the Victorian Albert Museum and then became a historic advisor to Royal Dalton before embarking on his current career as a freelance writer and lecturer, specialising in 19th and 20th century art and design. And we're thrilled his return to the fold of the NCS and that he continues in his quest to bring 19th and 20th century ceramics to our society. Today he's speaking on the subject of colour in Victorian ceramics. Thank you. Where's the shift? Well, thank you, Pat. Um, and just for the history, just for the archive and for the history, that vase which caused waves of shock horror, I remember it well, was a Moorcroft vase. Um, and a thing that, of course, links unexpectedly links me to our first speaker, to Ray, is that I too attended Keele University. Briefly, it has to be said, I came here in the autumn of 1963 and I left a year later. Um, we needn't go into the reasons why, <laughs> um, but they were, not, they were not significant. I was not sent down, to use that word. And to underline the forgiveness of Keel as an institution, many years later, in fact in, I think, 2008 or 2009, they gave me an honorary degree. So they were very forgiving in my earlier behavior. Anyway, so my attachment to Keel is really quite significant. Now, that's just the introduction. So, colour in Victorian ceramics. Well, I've always been interested in colour, and particularly colour in ceramics, but also the production processes of colour. And I think what a lot of people forget about the 19th century and Victorian period in, color, in, in, in general is that it was an immensely colourful period. The first half of the 19th century is wild with colour. And one of the problems of judgment of 19th century decoration generally is that we have been completely influenced by and inevitably by um, the colour palette of William Morris from the 1860s onwards and that has virtually obliterated what Britain looked like um, before the 1860s and colour was a fascination because colour technology was changing very rapidly now we're starting with blue printed plates but the point is that the early 19th century is marked with a succession of attempts to do colour printing on ceramics, mostly unsuccessful, um, and using technologies that were woefully complicated and inadequate. We've got to remember that a new printing process called lithography had been invented in 1798 in Germany, and this was used extensively for book illustrations. And as we'll see later, it had enormous impact in terms of colour as a published medium. But because that was going on in the 1820s and 30s, many potters thought, I wish we could do colour printing rather than having to employ all these people to paint it by hand. Um, and so we start with that, which takes us very quickly to that. Um, a very simple process is to have your copper plate or two copper plates and ink them up in different colours. And so that's a beginning of colour printing of a very basic kind. The point is it's, a, it's very laborious and is actually much slower um, than more conventional, conventional methods. Um, but what developed from it was a number of processes that actually did produce a printed colour image on the surface of the plate. Always um, on glaze, inevitably. Um, and you can see from examples like this with which you all be familiar that the process of multicolour printing had begun to emerge in one form or another um, by the 1830s, 1840s. And of course the pot lid, uh, the Pratt and Felix Pratt and Company pot lid, is the classic example. And I think probably everybody knows how these were produced. They are transfer printed, but they're transfer printed from a number of transfer printed sheets in different colours 
which are then overlaid. And, of course, in that, you have the fundamental principles of colour color printing as it emerged later. So, again, although these were very laborious and quite complicated to do, perfect registration was, of course, very important. You can see, and you all know, uh, the, that the, the results could be spectacular in terms of colour. And, of course, this links to things in the printing area like Baxter prints. It's the same process, basically, um, applied to ceramics. Meanwhile, of course, um, the tile industry was racing ahead. Um, the process of encaustic tile manufacture, a lost medieval process, had been re-established during the 1830s, um, and coloured, um, stained coloured glazes, stained, stained coloured bodies were well known already. And the desire to reproduce and recreate um, Gothic medieval floors was well established. Um, and then, of course, you have the, uh, the process of making tile, tiles mechanically, uh, which, of course, made production much simpler. And this fashion for bright floors really took colour um, into a new dimension in the 19th century. And if you start look, looking at the major buildings that had multicolour polychromatic floors from the 1840s, it is an enormous list. And luckily, uh, many of these survived. They can be coloured, they can be geometric, they can be all sorts of things. And of course, at the, at the peak of their development, um, they're the, the main meeting room of the, um, of, of the Palace of Westminster. And of course, Pugin was very much involved in this as the designer of all these tiles. And in fact, I think it's worth remembering that Pugin was actually the designer of every single, every single thing you can see in that room, except the structure. And we forget that. Barry was a great architect and he planned a great building, but he didn't know how to do Gothic. And so he employed someone as a partner who did know how to do Gothic. And the tiles were one of the, one of the great expressions of polychromy um, in, this, I, 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 in this period. Um, we're looking at the early 1850s. And of course, from that point, um, tile, coloured tiles became universal. They go into pavements in terrace houses, they go into um, all sorts of aspects of domestic decoration because they brought colour in in a very simple and direct way. And inevitably one goes to the V&A and sees the fam famous ceramic staircase, again of a similar period where you've got a combination of uh, majolica glazes, uh, coloured tesserae and mosaics, um, in, 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 in inlaid colour, pavements, it's an extraordinary explosion of colour diversity. And you can see, um, away from the, the, the ceramics, you've got the painted ceilings. You've got this sense that colour was a really important part of um, contemporary design ideas. And indeed, at the top of the stairs, you can see one of the great ceramic pillars uh, that has recently, or relatively recently, been put back together from store. And that was where the original ceramic gallery was. So all those delicate 18th century porcelains with their soft colours were put in cases in a room which was a riot of bright colours. And nobody at the time thought that was odd. Because also, don't forget, um, pre-Raphaelite and later paintings were hung on William Morris wallpapers. Not something we do today, but at that point it was absolutely the way to do things. And of course, allied to that is the process of the Collins and Reynolds patent of block printing, which was extensively used for tiles from 1849 when the patent was registered. Uh, when it came out, um, Alfred Reynolds was Minton's um, um, of, uh, production manager, I think, and they developed this process which took off from the, um, the idea of the, the Pratt print, um, the Botley print, whereby you print different areas of solid colour onto different pieces of paper, which you then put onto the surface of the tile, and they then create these areas of dense colour. The secret, which they took from the floor tiles, was blocks of solid colour. Uh, and that's why it was called, by many tile manufacturers, the block process. The name Collins and Reynolds soon disappeared into history. Um, but the point is, it could be used in a variety of colours, with great intensity, as you can see from the minstrel on the far side, 
gold was possible to print. It, and again, once again, what do we see? We see the tile, a decorative, illustrated tile, simply taking over uh, the 19th century interior. So by the 1860s, 70s, we've got a real sense of very, very vibrant colour on both a, 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 co a commercial, uh, a corporation and a, a domestic level. Uh, it was a very colourful time to live. But let's go back to where we started, lithography. What, what also develops at this point is something called chromolithography. Well, as it says on the box, this is about colour printing. And this little diagram basically shows how it works. Lithography, you'll probably know, is a, is a means of printing off a, a prepared flat piece of limestone upon which a design is placed using, using oil-based inks. Um, and it is flooded with water, and the water is rejected by the oil in the inks. And so when you colour it up with ink for printing, um, the ink does not go where the water is. It sounds complicated, it's actually quite simple. Um, and initially it was a one or two colour process. But like the Prattware, what rapidly developed was the sense that if you have lots of stones, each one prepared separately, and with a design that fits together, you can build up, stone by stone, a multicolour image. And so here you've got nine stones, which start with um, the, the, the first colour, the flesh colour, as they call it. And it goes all the way down um, to number nine, which is the, the darker grey. And the other thing, of course, is that some of these inks um, were translucent. And therefore, if you laid one ink on another, you got a separate colour. Now, this process was developed entirely for book illustration and later for posters. It had nothing to do with ceramics whatsoever. But it's very important to remember that this is going on at exactly that time. And the first chromolithographic colour printed books appear in the 1830s. And they again set a pattern which changes the whole process of design in Victorian Britain. This is the frontispiece of Pugin's great glossary of ecclesiastical ornament, published in 1844. Now this is a design book. It's the um, Chippendale director of its day. This was a book on how to do Gothic. And it was filled throughout with gloriously coloured pages. And it talks about pattern and tiles and textiles, metalwork, everything. And so if you were doing Gothic design, you naturally bought this book because it told you how to do it. And this became the great age of the pattern books. Um, we all know how important the pattern book was in previous ages. In the 19th century, it was about colour pattern books. And you could buy an ever-expanding ever library of books with glorious colour printing. Many have been reproduced, but the quality of the original has never been matched. There is something about the richness of Victorian chromolithographic printing that no modern technology can ever equate. The golds, the richness, the extraordinary colours are really quite remarkable. And this is the sort of page that's in it. And this is, these are technically designs for, for textiles, but it doesn't matter. You as a designer sitting at your desk in Minton in 1850 or 60, you simply got out the pattern books. And that was one of the most important reasons why uh, the Minton archive had to be saved, because it was a complete insight into the Victorian design process. You worked from printed examples of other material. Um, and these sort of things would certainly have been things that Minton and other factories would have known about. And, uh, and of course, many others follow. Um, Owen Jones' Grammar of Ornament, um, 1854, took the whole idea further. Glorious colour, but in the, in the process of glorious colour, you travel the history of the world. You want to do Egyptian? We've got Egyptian. Turkish, Moresque, and so on, and so on, and so on. Page after page after page of much richer colours than these illustrations are here. Um, that you have to accept that they have an extraordinary intensity. And when you think about the constant popularity of Egyptiana through the 19th century and beyond, 
Does it all come from Napoleonic explorations or David Roberts? A lot does, but equally, I think far more come from these handbooks, which are sitting there in all the major design studios um, in Victorian Britain. Um, and here we have more pages. Um, and interesting, the, the one on the nearest me is called Savage Tribes. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means an awareness of native North Americans. It means an awareness of other so-called, in Victorian language, savage tribes. But it's an, it's, it's an awareness that it wasn't just the famous cultures of the past that we have to revisit. It was also about looking at the inspiration of the world. And The Grammar of Ornament is a book of immense value, if you think about for anybody thinking about the process of design in the 19th century. Um, it was essential reading, and of course it was there. And Owen Jones was followed by um, William Wardsley, who did a great variety of design books. Some were specific. There's a whole book about the Alhambra. So if you want to do um, Middle Eastern design, you buy the book on the Alhambra. Um, there's a whole book on Japanese art, and so on and so forth. And by the 1870s, there was a great, as I said, a vast library of these. Uh, that one on the far side, perhaps a bit surprisingly, is called Chinese. But anyway, that's how they saw Chinese. That's fine. And this is actually a page from an orderly one um, showing about in leaves from nature, the impact of nature. So you've got the impact of ancient cultures um, and ancient civilizations and other styles. And of course, there are Renaissance styles, there are 18th century French pages, everything you want is there. But of course also nature is becoming increasingly important um, through this period. So we see again um, the pattern book is a key to everything that happens. And I know this is supposed to be about pots, but you know we have to look at pots in a wider concept and see how we get to pots. You'll all know this, St Giles's Church Cheadle, um, an amazing uh, Pet Pugin building for the Earl of Shrewsbury. The only building in Pugin's troubled life where the client, the Earl of Shrewsbury, said, to hell with the cost, just build it. And this church cost £46,000 in 1846. A, a fully equipped small parish church was between two or £3,000. So this was something special. And of course the special was not the outside so much as the inside. And this is an explosion of colour. And I'm sure many of you have been there. If you haven't, you should go immediately. Um, if you want to understand Victorian colour, there is no better example. This has survived miraculously intact as it was painted in the 1840s. And it's pattern upon pattern upon pattern, colour upon colour. Uh, Pugin was a great colourist. He understood complementaries. He understood colour balance. He also understood that colours seen in daylight change when seen in artificial light. He knew all that, and his designs of this church incorporate all those ideas in it. And of course there are Minton tiles galore um, on the floors and on the uh, behind. That's a side altar, the main altar has tiles in it. From there to Windsor Castle in the 1850s, and this of course is the Royal Dairy, designed by Prince Albert, and with, with, with the help of a um, an, another architect and designer whose name I've temporarily forgotten, uh, The Curse of Age. Um, it'll come to me in a minute. Um, and you can see that the, the, the designs are quite colourful, but of course when you look at the real thing, it is much more striking. And it's a mixture of encaustic tiles, printed tiles by the block process, um, majolica, which of course was already there uh, by then, and again, an, a, a, an absolute dynamic expression of Victorian colour, and again, luckily surviving, because it's had no reason not to survive um, it, as a private dairy in, 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 as, as part of Windsor Castle. And it's a remarkable statement about the, the, the love of colour at that time, in which ceramics, as you see, plays a considerable part. And so if you look at the, the fountains, the, the figure, you've got a combination of majolica, uh, the panels along the top, um, with their portrait busts of royal members of the royal household. You've got this extraordinary rich orange, um, again, behind those white figures. And then this over-encompassing over pattern of printed tiles. So it's printed, it's painted, and indeed these figures were there for a purpose, 
because it's a dairy and in those trough, troughs at the bottom cold water continually flowed and so these fountains fed those, uh, the, those troughs with cold water so the dairy kept fresh and believe it or not um, the late queen uh, was getting the milk for her cornflakes from this dairy well into the 1960s. It was only then that it was replaced by a slightly more modern example. And another, just another example, you may or may not know, this, this of course is the Grand Midland Hotel at St Pancras Station, having been restored. And the restoration was very good and very thorough and very faithful. And once again, just imagine walking You've come off your train from Manchester. You've finally pulled in into, into St Pancras. I think it took seven hours by that route. Um, and you're, you've booked a night in the Midland Grand and you walk in and you think, I imagine, you think, wow. Um, because it gave a sense of richness and quality and, 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 and power, which of course is exactly what the Midland, one, Midland Railway wanted to say. And uh, the famous dining room at the V&A, again, uh, obviously now open once again as a, a restaurant um, ceramic pillars ceramic walls uh, painted tin ceiling but the dynamic of it entirely is colour um, a couple of other um, examples this is the waiting room on more than one of the more than stations um, and it's just that sense that this is how we want it to be they wanted to show off what they could do railway companies were very competitive and so there was, there was a, a pressure to do things um, more colourfully and bigger and bolder than anybody else. And colour was very much part of that argument. And of course, later in the century, it filters out into public buildings, pubs, restaurants, town halls, buildings that, again, where colour is important. And the glazed exterior of a Victorian pub had two functions. One, after a wild night, you could simply hose it down. Um, secondly, in the gaslight of the time, the flickering gaslight, you would see the lights and the colours reflected off the, off the glazed ceramic tiles. And so people out for a heavy night looking for a pub, they'd look down an alleyway and they'd see sparkling in the distance this tempting sign of a, of a public house. And so that sense of colour runs right through the 19th century. The Great Exhibition, of course, was very important, and of course it was the launch pad for a lot of this colour. Um, Owen Jones' book wasn't quite out, but the Pugin book was, um, and indeed other uh, books were available. And again, what one forgets is that the building itself was very colourful. The interior um, was painted in primary colours, blue, red and yellow. And Owen, De Owen, De Owen Jones designed that form of scheme. And what he knew from colour studies is that red advances and blue recedes. And so he, he brought parts of the building forward, he put parts of the building back. There is a structure to all this, it's not random at all. But looking down that wonderful series of lithographs, and what have we got? We've got colour printed lithographs. We know exactly what this exhibition looked like. There are no photographs, but we have these fantastic colour lithographs, chroma lithographs, that show us gallery by gallery, display by display, what it looked like. And this is one of those. And you could buy these um, and, and, and take them home. And we get a sense of that explosion of colour that this represented. It was so exciting to step out of a rather drab existence and go into this extraordinary interior and be exposed to the wonders of the world. And of course that is Pugin's medieval court. Um, he had to do it. He hated the idea of cast iron structure because it wasn't medieval um, but he was, a, he was sensible enough to realise that what he was offered at the Great Exhibition was a wonderful opportunity for what we would now call marketing he thought if I'm going to sell the Gothic style to the great British public this is the way I'm going to do it I'm going to have this display of coloured textiles, tile work metal work, everything um, that I see as part of the modern Gothic world and indeed, those planters you can see in the bottom left corner, they're Minton block printed tiles with Pugin patterns made for the Great Exhibition. And within that exhibition, there were lots of other exceptional things. 
The encaustic process was well established by then, of course, but it was being used increasingly not just for tiles. And here is the famous waste not want not bread plate by Pugin. And this again was something that was very much associated with the exhibition, it was designed in 1849. But it was one of the things that you couldn't buy anything at the exhibition. But once you were outside the Crystal Palace, there were souvenir shops and stalls, and you could buy things. And this is one of the things that people bought because they could. But more important, because that was already went there, was this was the first use by any potter of the Collins and Reynolds process, which I described earlier. Patented in 1849, bought immediately by, by Minton, and Pugin was the first person to see how this process could bring bright colour automatically or mechanically produced into a wider world. Pugin's vision was that everybody should have these. He wasn't just designing for the great and the good. He, wanted, he, was, a sort of, he was a sort of forerunner of Ikea. You know, he wanted everybody to have nice things in their houses. And he saw the Collins and Reynolds process as a key to opening up the door to a very much wider market. His other great creation, or one of his other great creations, was something called the Great Stone. Now this was a, a huge iron structure, as you can see, by Hardman's, and it was completely covered in mints and tiles in relief, modelled and designed, not modelled by, designed by Pugin, to be painted and finished in bright majolica colours. These must have looked spectacular. They're, I mean, it, it, it's much taller than me. It's a, it's a vast structure. You can see by the side, the tiles are nine-inch tiles, so you've got, you've got the scale from that. And what we don't know is whether any cathedrals actually bought them. Certainly none survive. Um, but a lot of the tiles survive individually. Um, there's a great variety of patterns. Most of them are pierced to allow the heat to pass through. But of course, the, the tile stove is a well-known European phenomenon. The, 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 the tiles radiate heat out steadily. But this application of colour to it was something that was quite new. And of course, that takes us into the whole subject of Majolica. You know, what was the greatest ceramic achievement of the 19th century? Well, you can argue that forever, but I think Majolica is pretty high on the list. Nothing like it had ever been seen before, and nothing like it was ever seen again. It was truly original. It was a completely Victorian statement. The idea of making brightly coloured objects accessible to a wide market, following on from Pugin, uh, was something considerably, it was revolutionary. And of course it all comes down to this chap, Leon Arnu, who developed all those temperature compatible glazes. The secret about Majolica is that all the colours are fired at once. And so you've got a biscuit firing and you've got a gloss firing. But the end result is a multicoloured object. Because there are in fact coloured glazes, not coloured enamels. And by that process um, that vast range of extraordinarily colourful objects that Majolica represents could be produced quite cheaply because there's only two firings. Normally, as anybody who thinks about porcelain will know, most colours require a separate, a separate firing, which made porcelain, bone china, very expensive. Uh, this was something different. And um, you can see, this again is an illustration from the time, a chromolithograph about coloured pottery. And there are two of the objects or versions of them that were in that illustration. But it, it, I think it's hard for us today to understand the absolute amazing impact of all this colour. Minton, Wedgwood, George Jones, many manufacturers showed Majolica in 1851, just as many manufacturers showed another uh, great development of, um, the, 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 of 1851, which of course was Paris. You know, the, the greatest ceramic modelling material ever made um, and again uh, a Victorian creation and you know this isn't to talk about Majolica but I think one's just got to remember that Majolica was not something that came out of nowhere it was something that follows that big pattern of colour pattern of colour development that I've talked about through the pattern books um, through the tiled floors into something that makes colour both extraordinary and very widely accessible it was a revolution. Now, of course, we know now, um, inevitably, how do you get these very bright colours? Well, you put a lot of lead in it, and therefore these were very dangerous pieces uh, for those who made them. 
And that indeed is the, re- the main reason, rather than fashion, why Majolica disappeared at the end of the century. Because you couldn't make good, strong Majolica colours uh, without lead. And so we go into a, a sort of phase of wishy washy Majolica um, at the end of the 19th century, um, um, and the whole thing dies out. But of course, um, it doesn't matter because the, the revolution had occurred. And the quality of Majolica, apart from the colour, is that re- it reflects every single aspect of Victorian design revivalist styles, classicism, Egypt. Japan and China, the Middle East, fitness for purpose. The bread plate is a classic example of Victorian passion for fitness for purpose. It's a bread plate. How do you know it's a bread plate? Because it's got ears of wheat on it in the decoration. Um, This is a pigeon pie dish. And that's pretty obvious, isn't it? But it means you can't cook a chicken in it. You can't do anything except put... Uh, pigeon pie. Now, of course, this is the serving dish. This is not the cooking dish. Within it was an oven-proof liner in which the pie was cooked. It was then placed into that and put on the table. So it's nearly oven to tableware, but not quite. It's on the way. Um, and the diversity of Majolica meant that the diversity of the Victorian household and the food they ate was reflected by it. There's a list, which I never can remember, of all the different plates for salad they made. There's a tomato plate, a lettuce plate, a radish plate, um, and on and on and on and on and on through the salad. And so if your maid served tomatoes on the lettuce plate, she'd be fired. You, know, you had to know what each of these things did. And that's why they had such big cupboards, because they were filled with wares specific to a purpose. The famous Minton... and and George Jones' strawberry plate. Well, it's going to be used in those days of real food two months of the year at most. So for ten months it's in the cupboard. And so when when it comes round to strawberry time again, you've got to rummage around and get out the strawberry plates because you can't serve them on the something else plate. And this was why it's so incisive about uh, Victorian life. And shellfish, particularly, was very, very popular. Everybody ate oysters. Oysters oysters weren't a luxury food. They were standard fare um, for everybody. And so the vast quantities of oyster plates that were turned out. But they're always in such wonderful and dynamic colours. And, of course, structural items. They loved the complexity of, um, of, of, of ceramic challenge. The technology of making large objects in ceramic, often in several pieces, all fit together, as in this uh, water fountain, is, is, is again a great achievement. How did they control the firing? So all those pieces fit together perfectly. Um, the famous plant stand in the Pottery Museum is an example of that. And as I'm one of the few people in the world who's taken it to pieces several times and put it together again, I appreciate very much that pure quality of firing procedure to get all those things that fit together perfectly. Um, and of course Majolica spreads into tiles inevitably uh, as you can see um, and there, there it is um, all those, bar- those big baskets are um, a, a, a sort of can't cantilevered out from the central support it's an amazing piece of engineering um, and there it is and that was a great hit in the exhibition of 1855 uh, not 1851 but of course if we talk about exhibitions we've got to come on to 1862 uh, this is the, follow- the, the London follow up and the key thing in that, which you can see again in this very, very colourful interior, um, was, we can't really see it there, but we'll come closer, is the great St George's Fountain. 30 feet high, 40 feet across, and completely made from separately fired components of um, um, Mint and Majolica that, again, all fitted together. And it was a remarkable thing. Um, the, the, uh, and it was a focal point it was a focal point of the exhibition this is where you met your friends we'll meet you at the, at the St George's Fountain you can hear them all saying it but of course it was extraordinarily colourful and these lithographs again slightly paler than they should be don't give a sense really of what it was like but um, it, 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 is, it, was, it was an amazing confection um, and a celebration of ceramic colour in the strongest terms um, and it included 
components that were in the Royal Dairy. Um, so, you know, uh, many things were, um, were, were reused in different ways. It had a very chequered history. Um, it was eventually booted out um, and it was re erected in the top picture um, in Bethnal Green, uh, where, the, where there was a, um, a museum outstation. And it sat there and it sat there and it sat there and it began to fall apart. A majority is not frost proof and so it began to break and crack. And that bottom photograph is just before it was demolished in about 1926. And there's always a fantasy that somewhere the figure of St George and Dragon survives in a shed, forgotten about. <laughs> well, I think forget it, because there's quite good records at the time that it was all ground up and turned into road core. So if you want to find it, dig up the roads around Bethlehem Green. But of course, what that takes us into is a, is, is, is a bigger definition of Victorian colour, which of course takes us beyond um, conventional commercial manufacture. Minton's and Wedgwood and George Jones and Co. and takes us into a, uh, the later phase, if, if you like, of colour. When I said that the Morris palette was much more subdued, I was not being dismissive. I was just simply saying it was a change in taste. But of course, within that framework, colour was still very important. And we see it in various forms and shapes um, at this period. Um, and with it, of course, comes, again, this reflection of fascinations of, of, of different cultures. William de Morgan, as we know, was absorbed by two things. One, the Middle East, and two, uh, the luster glazes of Spain, Islamic Spain, and Italy, Maiolica. Um, and he wanted to recreate those or reproduce them in his own way. Um, he was able to get his inspiration for the um, Islamic wares, A, from Owen Jones, and B, from the collections of Middle Eastern pottery that the V&A had from the 1850s. Uh, they're there, if you look at the labels, they've all got the date code on the end, and there's plenty of examples from 54, 56, 58. And they were broadly called Persian in that period. Nobody either knew or cared really where they came from, and they didn't know the dating of them. They just knew that they had come from the Middle East. And it, it, took a, it took later generations of scholars to actually sort out what they were. But this is simply because a museum in those days was a teaching establishment. It was there for design inspiration. And so he looks at that. He also looks at Italian and Spanish pottery in those collections. But more important, he wants to know how to do reduction fired luster. And I think, I think there's evidence, he actually came up and learned how to do it at Wedgwood. Um, in 1871. So, so many product producers of what we think of as artistic individual pottery actually had an industrial background. They couldn't do it without industry. Um, and we've, because what we get later in emerging during this period is this critically destructive uh, separation in Britain between art and industry. You know, it's why so much ceramic design has been so poor and design in other fields as well. Because much of the ceramic world turned its back on industry, much of its industry turned its back on art. And in the 19th century, that didn't apply. And so there was, there was an acknowledgement that the technology that you often needed was industrial, and you got it from industry. Um, but these pieces, um, again, they're very colorful, but they fit into that color context. You've got to see these, I think, um, the word coordination came up in Ray's talk and of course this is what we're talking about does your pot match your curtains and your carpet and your chair cover well this is the first time people began to worry about such things it's nothing to do with Laura Ashley and uh, later development, it's actually about putting together an interior space and without going down a dangerous but interesting distraction it's important to remember that nearly all the buyers of this stuff were women. <laughs> Newly enfranchised women with financial independence and a desire to be in charge of the look and decor of their own houses. Now, this is something that's taken for granted by all of us today, but Victorian women were the first to do it, and they did it because they could. And a critical thing are the various um, marriage acts 
Acts of the eight, early 1870s, when women who came into a marriage ceased by law to be chattels and ceased by law to have to hand over their money to their husbands. If they had money, they could retain it and use it themselves. And if you link that to the development of the department store and the development of printed catalogues and books and the invention of shopping as a leisure activity, you get to where we are today. And that's another reason why the design ideas in the 19th century are so important. Most designers acknowledged that their clients were women and therefore they had to cater for those tastes. And one of the many reasons, I think, for the death of the tableware industry in Staffordshire is that many of the designing companies, including Minton, who I work for, employed men as designers of tableware. Utterly pointless. <laughs> they, don't, they don't know how to use it. They don't know how, how, how to lay a table. They don't know how to cook. They just about know how to wash up. <laughs> and apart from paying for it, that's really all the only input that men have into interior decoration. De Morgan's tiles were his main output. They were wonderfully colourful. And he was the official tile maker for Morrison Company. If you look at a Morrison Company catalogue, and they do exist, from the shop in Oxford Street, the ceramic pages are all De Morgan's tiles. They didn't sell the vases so much, but they sold the tiles in huge quantities. And just think of a wall covered with these exuberant tiles. They weren't one-offs. They were designed to be seen as, as ceramic wallpaper as a whole. And of course, we can go through the whole art pottery movement in, in many directions, but what links the few examples I've picked are really colour. This is, of course, uh, Lin we're in Yorkshire, we're in Middlesbrough, we're at Linthorpe, and we're in the world of Christopher Dresser. But what is emerging, again, is an industrially produced pro product which by its manufacturing process is infinitely varied. Now this is, this is a very clever trick of the art pottery and arts and crafts movement. Make something which has an individuality and therefore the buyer can think, oh I'm going to have that one because it's not the same as that one or that one and therefore mine will be unlike any father, nobody else's will be quite like mine. I mean look at the, the glazed colours on the bowl on the far side. That mottled blue and green will never be the same from pot to pot. Now, for 100 years or so, the ceramic industry have been trying to stop that happening. And now they realised actually it was a huge benefit because it gives that sense of individuality. And the buyer can therefore make a choice. And um, all this is about consumer choice. And so the certainty that while you can make a production line of a thousand of those pots, by the time you've fired them, they're all slightly different. And that was the strong selling point. And this is where, in a sense, industry, convention industry is, is, is turned on its head. The one thing you can say about um, Puget's mint and bread plates, and I've seen hundreds of hundreds, I've seen a lot of them, they all look exactly the same. Um, but if you change those ideas and say, why should they look all the same? Uh, you, 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 you get a different philosophy. Um, I think that's Brettby, or I can't remember. Um, I mean, every, every company, Brettby, Bermontoffs, um, all these companies who went into art pottery production, all the potteries of Devon, for example. Um, they all went, first of all, for colour. Their shapes were exotic. They come from, and there you've got shapes from God knows where. You've got things from South America. You've got things from the classical world. All a hodgepodge of ideas flung together, and it simply didn't matter. Um, and then over them, you put these deliberately uh, flexible glazes that will do their own thing in the fire. And it was part of the, it must have been part of the excitement. If your job is to unpack a kiln all your working life, the one thing you'll know is that everything you take out will look exactly the same as the other things that came out. Unpacking a kiln at Bermontos must have been quite exciting because you never quite knew what you were going to find or what you were going to say, what you were going to see. And so colour moves from large scale production into smaller scale but still industrial production for a much more diverse market. Um, yes, that was Brettby. Um, this is um, Bermontofts. And you can see it's all about diversity. You've got Bermontofts doing Middle Eastern. You've got Bermontofts doing Japanese. You've got Bermontofts doing whatever you want. Um, and this is because 
everything had to be made to be sold. The fundamental point that Ray made is that, well, actually Colin Melbourne made in Ray's film, was that if you make things that don't sell, you're wasting your time and you'll be out of work very quickly because the company will go bust. It's the most basic principle of ceramic manufacture. If nobody wants it, don't bother. And you cover that possibility by, um, by um, making a range of things. And although it's an irrelevance, it always amused me at the time, I had a certain amount of dealing with the uh, chap who was the design director at Minton. Because every year, of course, he had to produce the new tableware patterns for the new season. And he would come down on a certain day every year and say, I want to look in the archive. <laughs> and I'd say, OK, help yourself. Because I knew what he wanted. He was going through looking for ideas. Nothing wrong with that. That's the way it was done in the 19th century. And eventually he'd reappear and he'd have a, a sort of a, a fistful of designs. He said, I'm just going to take these away um, to work something up. And apart from that, I never saw any of them again. Um, you know, I was there to serve the, the company. So that's how it worked. But I was interested that the whole process of design hadn't changed, really, since the Victorian idea. You, you, you get an idea, you look through the files, you get some inspiration, and you work it up. But the one thing he did say to me, I said, how do you do this? You've got to produce ten patterns. Yes, he said, the only secret that I can share with you is that as long as one of them sells, I've got a job. <laughs> the other nine you can lose, as long as there's one bestseller out of the ten. And the strange parallel in my life is it's almost exactly the same with publishing. As long as one book out of every ten you publish sells, you're fine. <laughs> and, of course, coming to the end of my period, really, um, 1898, um, and we look at Pilkington, Royal Lancastrian, now, the focus of Royal Lancaster has always been on the luster glazes, um, which were made spectacularly from 1906. And I think, in a way, they're less important than the monochromes which were produced earlier, because these were really experimental in the way we've been looking at, and they're all about colour. And I think, in a way, these achieved an extraordinary um, forward movement of design and, and colour and appreciation of modernity. By 1906, luster was really old hat. And so although they are splendid and spectacular, uh, those Royal Lancastrian luster pieces are really, they're almost revivalists. They're almost looking back rather than looking forward. Whereas the monochromes are, I think, spectacular examples um, of uh, looking forward. And of course, we're now getting colours we've never had before. Think of the number of new elements added to the periodic table from the 1890s onwards, or from the 1880s onwards, really. Um, you've got to sing that Tom Lira song to get them all. But obviously, uranium is one of them. And we learnt very early on that uranium gives us spectacular yellows and oranges. Titanium gives you something else. You can go through them all, because basically ceramic colours come from metallic elements, lead, copper, iron and so on. But so give us more metallic elements and we get more colours. And so once again this um, science handed the potter a wonderful new palette of, of, of things to play with. Um, and some of these uh, particularly at Royal Lancastrian reflect that. Now I'm going to end um, with one of my many heroes who is William Housen Taylor I'm again slightly stretching. I'm slightly stretching the word Victorian here, um, because most of his work is actually in the early 20th century. But he does start working in 1898 uh, when he founds the Ruskin Pottery, um, and he was, above all else, an almost astonishing glaze experimenter. Um, he was fascinated by glaze. He was fascinated by diversity of shape and the relationship between glaze and shape. Now, this is a photograph taken of him at the very end of his life. He closed the pottery in 32 or 33 and dies in 34. Um, and so a lot of the things that you can see in the picture aren't relevant to what we're talking about. But from the early days, working with his father, people forget that his father was his business partner until 1912 um, in the running of the Ruskin pottery. Um, having written a book about it, um, I still find I know very, very little about it. There are no archives, there's no records. A lot of this is conjecture. And 
nobody quite understands how he did his work. He, he was able to, 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 to oh, his employees were able to, um, on a lathe, thin down the wall of a stoneware object. They're not porcelain, they're stoneware, to the point where you think it must collapse in the firing. Um, and yet it comes out of a high temperature fire in absolutely perfect shape. And I don't think any, I've never met a potter who can explain how that was done. And, but his real experiments were with glazes. He was fascinated by Far Eastern glazes in particular. And rather like Pilkington, his early life was spent experimenting with glaze colours on a range of fairly conventional shapes. And in those days he had catalogues and everything was listed and illustrated in the catalogue. He was one of the first to use colour illustrations in his catalogues uh, because colour printing, um, again, ordinary colour printing, I mean commercial colour printing, was available by then. Um, and the other mystery of, of, of Western pottery is however you look at it, its finances do not work. We know the size of the kiln. We know how many pieces he could fire with each firing. We know what they cost, and none of it works, because those firings never produce enough to maintain a factory for 30 years, which employs up to 15 people. So I thought, oh, there must have been private money. I go back to his will, no, there's not a secret pile of houses or something. I go back to his father's will, who was the headmaster of the Birmingham School of Art, no, there is no secret money. So how Ruskin operated a business, I have no idea, and I fear we'll never know, because he was an assiduous destroyer of notes and drawings and patterns. And it is recorded that before he left the factory, he had a series of bonfires in the office fireplace, burning paperwork. So whatever the history, whatever mysteries he had, he took away with him. But of course, his really spectacular achievement was in the development of reduction fires. Um, from their glazes. He was not the first to do it, but he was the first to do it properly in Britain. Bernard Moore, Dalton, they were doing basically uh, sort of from their lustres onto a, a glazed porcelain body. Ruskin, or rather House and Taylor, was doing it onto a stoneware body um, with copper glazes which had that total unpredictability and with very, very sensitive variations in the firing temperature. It really mattered whether you fired it at 1148 or 1152. Um, it would either all burn off or it would all be black. Um, and so that variation, in a sense, is what established his reputation. It, of course, was all based on Chinese technology. Um, but through the 19th century, again, there'd been this pursuit of these bright reds. It starts in, I think, Serre in the 1848. It goes through Copenhagen. It goes to America in with a chap called Johnson in the 1880s. Um, we are quite late players in this field, um, but it's House and Taylor who really conquers it and masters it, unlike anybody else. But again, think of the impact of these colours. Open that kiln and you see this explosion of dynamic colour. And of course, for him, it must have been even more dramatic because he didn't know what he was going to see. You know, every one would be different. Um, he was an extraordinary man in every sense. His, without, any, without going into any details like as I now, his private life was unbelievably complicated, um, which we won't go into now. But anyway, um, we needn't worry about that. But that came out, that did come out in the, in, in the writing of the book. But of course, I couldn't publish this of it because people were still alive. Anyway, never mind. Um, the point is, I think this is where colour comes to um, at the end of the 19th century. This, exploration of exotic colour growing out of that sense that colour, richness intensity of colour was something that the potters really created and embraced through the 19th century and to me that's why I've always loved the 19th century because I think it was, a, it was the most inventive and creative period in British history in every sense um, we had great wealth we could spend that wealth um, we could do things we've never done before. We had advancing technology, which made it so much easier to do difficult things. Um, and at the same time, we had we, we, so many people had this basic passion to do something different 
and to use a combination of technology and pure, brilliant craft skills to create new things. You know, what made Leon Arnu <coughs> sit in his office in Minton in Stoke on Trent and think, I know what we need. We need lots of coloured glazes that all fire at the same temperature. You know, brilliant idea. Other people would have had it before, but they said, oh, it's too difficult. We can't do that. He did it. And it was, it, it, it was partly his French background, working in um, factories in the south of France, that gave him the, the knowledge. But that, to me, is what makes this period so exciting. And, and there's a long way to go, I think, still in, in understanding what the Victorians were all about. If you play that game, what was the most important thing the Victorians gave us? To me, high on that list is colour printing. What a dull world we'd have without colour printing. Thank you. Any questions? Comments? Complaints? <laughs> Thank you so much, Paul, for that lecture. I could listen to all, to that straight through again. Well, you can. You've still get, it. Yes, I, I have. I have recorded it. <laughs> so we will delete it if you want I us to, but I, I, I will treasure that. Um, any questions? Paul's got to leave us fairly promptly, but we've right, got time for some time. questions. I finished in good time. Thanks. Fabulous lecture. Um, Dolph Lambeth Art Pottery Studio, 1870s, suddenly sludge colours. Explicable in technical terms, but in aesthetic terms, this is earlier than the greenery, yellowy grove in the gallery, isn't it? Yeah, it's 1871, it starts. And I think you've actually, set, you've actually hit it on the net. Henry Dalton said, under, under persuasion from John Sparks, the head of the Lambeth School of Art, he said, OK, after a lot of argument, he gave him, he said, OK, I'll let your students make things if you insist that it's good for them. The only condition I lay down is that whatever they make has to be fired in the same kilns as my drain pipes. I'm not building special kilns for art students. And those colours are what you can get. However, if you move on in the 20th century and you look at the work of Gilbert Bayes, it was actually possible to create a much, much bigger palette, a much wider palette that could be used on salt-based stoneware. But in the 19th century, those were the, the constraints. And that's why I think people like uh, Brett B. Berman Toft, the Devon Potteries, they didn't have those limits, and therefore they could go in any direction they wanted. All they wanted to do was make things that sold. I mean, Dalton was very successful. I sometimes, even though you know, I started my interest with Dalton, I sometimes wonder why all those sludgy things were so popular. But they clearly were. Perhaps not everybody liked bright colours. You, you mentioned uh, uh, Dalton and uh, this wonderful colours, and you might mention the flambe. One thing I did do with but, and it must be 20 years ago, it might be 25, is go to the home of Sir Richard Bailey, uh, who, and who granted us a, 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 an interview. And I asked Cathy to actually conduct the interview and filmed it all. I particularly was very pleased to see something in his front room that I had commissioned and was a one-off creation by the, uh, um, the dog designer in 1975 for my first cover film, which is called Power Over the Clay, and it begins with a lump of clay forming itself by animation uh, into a potter uh, making a pot, uh, and it was never taken up by Dalton, it never became anything, but I went to interview Sir Richard and then it was in his front window, I said, well, I know where that, that came from, because there's only one, it's a one-off. But why I'm saying this is that Dalton had recently closed down their flambe uh, department 
and we tried to document it and get, uh, and there was no way that we could. It was, nothing was allowed, but it was all top secret how they got their wonderful vivid colors in the flambe process. Uh, and after we'd done this um, uh, interview, during it, Sir Richard actually described standing in and watching the firing of the flambe way which was very dangerous and very <laughs> hazardous. But he actually described it in great detail what happened. And after the interview, I looked at him and said, he's just given away the secret of what happened. <laughs> so we've got an exclusive interview with Sir Richard Bailey about how the Broadway firing actually uh, proceeded. It was very strange um, seeing this, and it just reminded me of yeah. that. I'm thinking of Cassidy as well. Well, it is, I mean, for a start, he was my boss. I was. I, I joined Minton, I think, in 76, Dalton as it was, Royal Dalton Tableware. So he was my boss. And so I think the Flombe department had just closed down. But I, I, there's, there's a letter in existence, I don't know who it is, from between, a correspondence between Dalton and Bernard Moore. Because Bernard Moore, of course, had produced that style of Flombe glaze earlier. And he sold the process to Dalton for two thousand pounds, and the letter spec up and two thousand pounds in nineteen o two was quite a bit of money um, but I say as it, but it, it's important to remember that both Bernard Moore and the Dalton Flambe, most people and certainly Walter Moorcroft among others, would not accept it as a Flambe process because it's actually like a it's flashed on like a luster. You, it goes on to a, a pre-glaze surface and that's why it burns off and indeed with a bit of sandpaper you can actually take it off why you'd want to do that I don't know but um, whereas a true flambe will is, is, is endurably there as part of the, part of the body So it's very like the um, the um, original luster process. Yes, it is very similar. Where, where you put where you put the luster in a clay body on the surface. That's right. Yeah. Well, I think I, I, I now remember that that um, the, 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 the the secret of flambe is that you need really dirty coal gas mm. to get the interaction between the carbon and the oxygen and all the other elements. And North Sea gas is too clean. Yes. So you, you, you had to recreate t dirty coal gas in your case. <laughs>
there are no more questions, I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you to Paul. <laughs> I must say that it's the first lecture, and you can imagine I've been to a lot, where they talked about where the, where the speaker talked about in the 19th century, and I wasn't invited to actually consider where the shapes had come from. It's the very first time anyone's told me to look at the colour. And it was like a revelation. It was, it was looking at pots completely differently. So it was really nice to have that challenge. I don't know if you intended to challenge us all, no. but well, you certainly challenged me. So I'd like to say thank you, because it can get... Sometimes you're just looking for some other way to look at pots, and I found it today. So I want to say thank you very much, and I'm sure the rest of the audience wants to say thank you too. Thank you. Any notices about the next meeting? Or yes, thanks. Thanks very much for coming along today, and I want to thank uh, Keel University and Arts Keel because we're allowed to use these facilities free of charge um, because I have a small um, contract with with Keel and I work here, which is my my pleasure. And I'm very pleased to continue the relationship between the Northern Ceramic Society and Keele University and continue this series of lectures on uh, arts subjects. Um, our next Northern Ceramic Society meeting is at Leeds University. This is a new collaboration. We're going to the Brotherton Library and Archive. It's a library special collection and archive at Leeds University. Um, we're having a styled lecture uh, by uh, Melissa, Melissa, Melissa Gallimore, sorry, um, once, who once was a curator at Harwood House and is now a freelance uh, ceramics curator, and her lecture will be on chinoiserie. And that will incorporate the relationships between ceramics and furniture and other decorative arts. And then the other half of the day, we'll be looking at items from the archive and special collections at the Leeds Brotherton Library. And this is new to me too, so come and explore uh, that, uh, that new venue for, for our meetings. Um, the following meeting is our AGM in May, and we're going to the Grosvenor Museum in Chester, one of our regular uh, contributors, uh, collaborators there, the Grosvenor Museum. Um, and then the summer visit will be in late June or early July, and I'm afraid I haven't um, finally decided on the venue for that because I've got a choice of about three and I can't decide which one to go with. It's embarrassment of riches I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. But watch this space and I know that there's some members who uh, don't engage with the website but if you know who those people are and they're relying on po the post please assist them by giving them a ring, uh, letting them know when the, the, the meetings programme comes out and especially the summer visit uh, because we have no physical mailing before the end, uh, sorry, before the date of the summer visit. Uh, and don't forget to sign up for the, the newly announced luxurious version of the, the Chester University Ceramics Summer School. Uh, guaranteed showers that stay on, I think. <laughs> Fantastic. And maybe even a, not a shared bedroom, dormitory, no? <laughs> Private facilities, well, that's the thing. It's always good fun and it's great to, to be together for longer than just, just a day. So I think that's about it. But are there any other people in the room or any other committee members who've got any notices or anything that I've forgotten? Or shall we? Great. Well, thanks very much for coming. I've just enjoyed today immensely. So thank you.